He's just trying to get, Jim is not here right now. issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, we've done 2016. We're, we've done 2016. Very exciting year, but I tell you, 2017 is going to be even more exciting. In all due respect, uh, we've just gone through I mean, everyone is pretty well stressed out, and everyone is all, where do we go from here in the whole election process? We had a presidential election. We, we left, if you will, a, a full-scale eight years talking about the issue of race, and I'll just be right up front with you, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is we all got to the table. You know, some are satisfied, some are not satisfied, but the fact of the matter is we talked about that issue, and now all of a sudden, we would, now we've got to get into the, uh, the other work, if you will, of the matter. We've got another individual that's going to be president-elect. And we're talking about Donald Trump, the businessman. First time a business person, for instance, is going to be president of these United States. A person that has never run for office, any office for that matter, has been teetered around just like a number of us, you know, basically talking about the election. But we've never been a part, if you will, of that other piece of business, of politics, if you will. And that's going to be very exciting. So I think for the next four, four years, it's going to be very, very exciting. And uh, think about it, uh, we've got CNN on one side, we've got Fox on the other side, and we've got a businessman sitting up there that's willing to just get right down to the bottom line of the business. We're, it's going to be in a very exciting year, and it's going to be the best thing for this country, too. We need to talk about some of the issues that are here, res that resonate within our own area. It's called these United States of America, because we are the key point. Well, with, with, with that... We're gonna, that's what we're going to discuss today. I've got, I got a key person with me today. You, you probably recognize his face. His name is Richard Burke of Western Liberty Network. He wears a number of hats. But give you a little background in terms of where he's at. And he's got a lot of work, too. He was just, he was just appointed, if you will, to the Ethics Commission That's right. for the State of Oregon, the Ethics mm -hmm. Commission. And you might have heard that word before because there was something that was being said, if you will, about the fact that some states are thinking about putting the, the election process and the Ethics Commission together. We haven't done that yet in Oregon, but guess what? That's going to be a discussion in this, 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 this up, upcoming year, for that matter, or the upcoming four years, because there's an issue. But anyway, he's got that background. He's been a libertarian for, for a number of number of years, been very, very much involved in that, in that area. But most important, he's been with Western Liberty Network, very important piece. And the other thing, he's an elected official. I mean, he's, a, he's an elected official. You've got Western Liberty Network that basically kind of tells you how to run for office. And who was the first client? Himself. <laughs> <laughs> just blows your mind. And then all of a sudden, I got involved in the last round, and all of a sudden, I'm involved in this deal. In fact, it, it was really beneficial because when I ran for mayor of the city of Portland, unlike $10,000 coming out of my pocket, in all due respect, I realized in all, due, all I needed to do was file. Mm -hmm. And for that $700, you know, and all of a sudden, I was very effective. Out of 15 candidates, I finished number four. You did. Imagine if, if I had money. It would have been dangerous. I, was, I, would have been, I would basically say, Richard, now that I've won, what do I do? <laughs> anyway, I, again, happy New Year's and happy holidays to all of you. We're right here at the midst of that piece, too. We want to make sure we, we put that on the table. But again, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk, give you a little politics. We're going to get, get Richard to give us some, feel, <clears throat> some feedback on, on maybe some of the questions I may ask of him or he may ask me some questions or whatever. And we're going to talk about politics the first half hour. And in the second half hour, we're going to talk about Western Liberty Network because, in all due respect, part of the solution to our problems that we're going to be really looking for is good leadership, good leadership. So we're going to be looking two years down the road. We're going to have an election process aspect of it. And he's going to be, he's putting on a, he's going to be putting on a conference here on the 28th, 28th of January. 28th of January. He's going to get a little bit more involved in that piece aspect of it. But we're looking for leadership. In all due respect, that's where you get it, folks. If you want to know about getting involved in the process, how to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, hey, that conference is out of sight. I'll be there. And with that, Richard, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Bruce. It's How's always holidays? great to be here. Oh, fantastic. Yep. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, look, let's just jump right on in there. Sure. Let's, let's maybe talk about, uh, what do you think about the, the, the presidential election aspect of it? Well, here's what I've been thinking. Uh, on one side, the United States is one of the first countries, perhaps the first country, that was based on an ideology. Mm -hmm. Not heritage or religion, but on an ideology. And I think that many Americans adhere to some kind of ideology, but not primarily. There are liberals out there who are 
progressives, mm -hmm. but what they care most about is getting their kids through college, making their washer and dryer payments, mm -hmm. getting into a house, paying for it. As you've said before, they want to eat. Yep, they want to eat. Right? Right. And I think there are a lot of conservatives out there. Mm -hmm. They're ideologically, you know, oriented, but their primary concern is, you know, am I going to have a job? Can I pay for my house? Can I make my car payment? Can I put my kids through college? They want to eat. They want to eat. As you say. <laughs> and, you know, even in my own party, the Libertarian Party, there are a lot of folks who are um, ideologically driven, but many of the Libertarians that I know are folks that have jobs and businesses, and, you know, that's what they're looking at first. And I think that one of the reasons why Donald Trump won the election mm -hmm. is because he focused on that. He went to the struggling middle class and saying, look, the stock market looks great, people who are wealthy are doing great, but you're not. We've got to, you know, come up with a way to reorient the direction of this country so that people can have jobs, they can have homes, they can put mm -hmm. their kids through college, you know, so you can eat, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And uh, the left, I think, largely forgot about that. I think that they were very into climate change, alternative energy, you know, they don't really care. Hillary talked about shutting down the coal jobs, mm -hmm. all of these things. And that's why you see, and I, th I think it's true, I saw a presentation a little while ago where the Democratic Party is largely a coastal party now. And uh, it is not a, a national party. It's like a third of the House caucus comes from three states. Hmm. If you take a look at the red and the blue on the map at the county level, what you see are coastal urban yes. areas, yes. and the rest of it is Republican. I'm not a fan of one party rule one way or another, but Republicans now control the House, the Senate, the White House. Um, the uh, They'll control the Supreme Court. They control most of the state legislators. The governors. The governors. And a lot of the other seats. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm glad to see progressiv progressivism uh, receding. Uh, I'm glad to see that. I'd like to see stronger libertarian presence. Mm -hmm. uh, however, one of the things that I'm very happy about with respect to Donald Trump's election is that I believe that he will break the back of the concept of political correctness being used as a means to control the speech and ideas of others. Mm -hmm. okay? Interesting concept. He's going to make a lot of mistakes, a lot of things that I will disagree with and you might disagree with and others, but I think he'll at least do that. And if he does that, that could do more to protect and advance freedom, particularly mm -hmm. freedom of expression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. anything else. I mean, I'm not in favor of people being jerks or being racist or making offensive mm -hmm. comments. Mm -hmm. But if we use political correctness as a way to silence people, mm -hmm. which is what I think it is used as, mm -hmm. I think that is a larger danger to our democracy than Russian hacking mm -hmm. or uh, you know, any conspiracies. Mm -hmm. I think that is the real danger, and I think and hope that at least, if he does nothing else, Donald Trump will break that. Let's talk a little bit about some of those things that you were just sharing with us. When you think about Donald, and uh, how he how he got into the race, mm -hmm. and how he identified other than the middle class. Yeah, he also picked up those other individuals that were quote let's say on the welfare with this that and the other whatever. The he little got people. some. He got he some. He got a lot of those folks, if you will. But it was as it, but it, but the way he projected it as if, and then the way the reaction on the other side. But it, it was a large group. There are a bunch of races and all this that and the other. Uh -huh. Not a lot routine. But the fact of the matter, they got to eat too. Yeah, they got to eat too. <laughs> they got to right. eat too. You know. And um, and so I, I I thought that was a that was a very interesting piece, if you will. I think that sort of carried into the to the last eight years of the That's issue right. of race aspect of it. So that was kind of neat. It, it put them right at the table, also too. You got me. I think so too. I don't think I, I mean Donald Trump is not a libertarian, yeah. but I don't believe he's racist. No, no. I, I worked for Donald Trump. I met Donald Trump uh, just for a couple of minutes. I have to qualify that, uh, but. I've watched him very closely, and I know people that he's worked with, and I don't think he's motivated by race. Mm -hmm. I think he uh, he needs to be educated. He needs to make sure that he has good people around him, but I think he wants our country to win. Mm -hmm. I think he wants our country to be successful. Mm -hmm. I think he wants there to be more freedom. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to learn a lot, particularly in his first year. And again, um, he's not a libertarian. He's not a conservative. If anything, he's a populist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. And 
I think it, it will, there will be, he will break the establishment as mm-hmm. we know it. Mm-hmm. You know, as, it, as as you think about the, the last, well, the, during, the, during the election period aspect of it, and I think for the, for, the, for the viewing audience, they need to know what actually happens during a primary and a general election. Mm-hmm. Normally the masses are not involved, if you will, yeah. during the primary, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And then they're involved in the general. That's kind of like at the end of the campaign aspect of it. And it's really not as in-depth, if you will, as that of the uh, primary. Right. Well, primaries are where... Small 10%. You know what I'm yep. saying? Primar- you primaries are where <laughs> ideologically driven people... Politicians. ...get involved. <laughs> and a whole bunch of other folks. Yeah, people that are really driven by ideology. Yep. Yep. They yep. go to the primary and, you know, to get the nomination, you've got to appeal to those folks. Yep. 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 Uh, even in the Libertarian Party. Right. What right. you see is when you have people that are competing for the party's nomination. Right. They go to state conventions. Right, right. You know, right. they try to win delegates. Right. And right. the people who go to right. the convention tend right. to be among the more ideological right. Right. of right. those party members. And so when the general election yeah. comes, the question is, how do I get everybody on board? Yeah, yeah, because they, they, they weren't participants. That's right. And the other side, they weren't participants. That's right. So how do they get them? That's where all the money comes out. Mm-hmm. That's when the flyers get out, they were mm-hmm. kissing the babies and all that other good stuff. And That's right. Telling you what you want to hear, mm-hmm. that kind of routine. And then there's the other group, if you will. That's that media group, if you will. And all of a sudden, they're part of the process. But then, then if, you didn't, if you don't understand the primary... <laughs> You really can't understand where they're coming from because they tend to take the baton and they run with it now. Yeah, that's right. Fair? Is that fair? You yeah, got me? That's right. And so then there's a pro and a con aspect of it. But you got the R's on one side, the norm that's identified as CNN, and then you got Fox on the other side. The, 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 I think you got that backward, but yeah. Right? CNN's more liberal. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. CNN is more liberal, more and then you got the more conservative aspect of it. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just a comparative. They still all have to eat. They couldn't be talking the same language. That's right. They got to eat. <laughs> right? They, got, they couldn't be well, talking. Well, it's an industry. It, it's an industry. Big time. Yeah, politics is, on top of everything else yeah. is an industry. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, And yeah, it has yeah. people competing yeah, yeah. for jobs. Yep, yeah. there's a degree program in that in the whole arena. That's too, right. Mm-hmm. The whole nine yard aspect of it. And I, and I, and I guess the thing that, I, that sort of got me when, in that whole pro, that particular process was the fact that in the general election, people were really upset with the media aspect mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. But in many cases, a lot of those folks in that general election can't even afford Comcast. Yeah. If you want to say, That's they, right. they don't even look at TV, they don't read the newspapers, you know, that type of deal. Well, so, this is the fragmentation of the media. Yeah. It used to be CBS, NBC, and yes. ABC, a little bit of PBS. And uh, with three networks, they had to appeal to everyone. Yeah. They were competing yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Now we've got, you know, a gazillion networks, and they're fighting for market share. And uh, they believe that they will prosper if they find a segment to support, yep. and then they push that segment. So now you've got CNBC yep. or MSNBC that caters to liberals. They bought, but, but they bought the airwaves, too. They bought the airwaves. <laughs> and over Fox. Here. Over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They bought the airwaves over here. The poor people at the point in time, they could turn that TV on and get yeah. it all. No, yeah. you can't get anything. You can't get anything. Or if you, get, if you manage to get on the Internet, there's a lot of news out there, but it all, I won't say all, but yeah. the vast majority yeah. of it is... Yeah targeted at a segment yeah. that and they try to give them what they want to yeah. hear so they'll continue to listen yes. and uh, that's the state of news now yeah uh, the traditional uh, sources of media are going broke yeah the Oregonian is you know like oh, that yeah. thin anymore oh, yeah. except the Sunday yeah. and it's mostly yeah. ads yeah the New York Times they just shut down three floors and that's up um, they're going out of business the yeah. TV news uh, shows now I carry my own TV you carry on TV. That's right. <laughs> I carry on. Here it is, right here, baby. Everything yeah. is right here. You know what I'm saying? But they've lost lots of viewers. Oh, they've lost a lot of viewers. Yeah. As a result of that. Uh huh. So, so that, everyone's that's another business. Everybody's doing their own thing. They're all doing their thing, and they they tend to go to news sources which reflect their beliefs yeah. to affirm their beliefs, yeah. Yeah. and that just increases the yeah. cycle. So yeah. we've got a nasty uh, media environment. Yes. That's increasingly biased and partisan on every front. Mm-hmm. And that's why people don't trust the media anymore. Yeah. It's a destructive cycle. If I want good news, it's really hard to find. Yes. I'll, I'll go to other countries. I'll go to like BBC mm-hmm. to find out what's going on around mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they've got their bias issues, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. You know, they're government funded mm-hmm. BBC. Mm-hmm. And there are other news sources as well. But mm-hmm. 
it's it's getting harder and harder to get good objective news. It's going to be pretty difficult too to get the truth because what's this new term that we got? We have in a whole new era now. It's called fake news. What's the, what's the word, what's that word that they talked about? It's now? fake news. It's fake news. See, mm -hmm. but you get it over here. You get it. You get it on this. Mm -hmm. And but people are looking at it. Yeah. And depending upon who the friend is, they, that's what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And then they create their own news. Yeah. So so now the key is that it's going to cost you more money to run. <laughs> If you want to get to everybody, it's inf it's information overload, and uh, we as a culture haven't figured out how to adapt to it yet. Wow! How are we going? To, how, how do you think we're going to address that? I here? don't have a clue. That's going to be a heavy piece. It's going to involve. I think one thing that would help is if we did a better job in our schools of teaching critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. education, education. And I am a, a big. Uh, I, I'm going to use bad grammar here. I'm yeah, big, yeah. I, I I I see myself as a in addition to the other things that I do, is an education activist, mm -hmm. particularly in the realm of school choice mm -hmm. and charter schools. Mm -hmm. I think that is is a key to increasing the uh, aptitude, or not the aptitude, but the performance of the cohorts that we send mm -hmm. through our school system. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key to having critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Government schools are very good at teaching kids how to follow orders, mm -hmm. but they're not very good at teaching them how to do creative thinking, mm -hmm. critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are about processing people. Mm -hmm. And it's not cost effective or politically effective to take care of the gifted kids. Or mm -hmm. to, you know, it's all about money and it's mm -hmm. about power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got people on school boards that see it as a stepping stone to running for the state yeah. senate. That's so right. they're making uh, political decisions instead of educational decisions. Yeah. Yeah. You've got the same situation with regard to teachers' unions. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of dedicated people mm -hmm. in the school system. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of teachers that really want to be good mm -hmm. teachers and mm -hmm. care about the kids. Mm -hmm. But the problem isn't with them. The problem is with the system and the incentives that you mm -hmm. have. So you've got to have more school choices. Mm -hmm. You've got mm -hmm. to have charter schools. You've got to have uh, private schools. You've got to vouchers, have... Vouchers and all Vouchers is, is an approach that some people support. I mm -hmm. think it's it's appropriate in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm... I'm not anti-public uh, school. I don't mm -hmm. want, you know, nobody wants to see schools mm -hmm. fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, I think one of the ways to save public schools is to make them accountable through the force of competition. Mm -hmm. Make mm -hmm. them compete for mm -hmm. the kids. Right now, if you're a Portland public school student mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have enough money to go to a, a private school, your charter schools are very limited, your open enrollment options tend to be very limited and if you're not able to find alternatives there you're stuck in the school that the portland public schools or the beaverton public schools mm -hmm. or a lot of other districts mm -hmm. say that you are mm -hmm. in that's it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the problem with that is that kids have different learning styles they have different needs and government schools just aren't good at that level mm -hmm. of granularity mm -hmm. when it comes to what they offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they offer what is, in many cases, political palatable, politically palatable to the largest number of people. Mm -hmm. And they're very uh, answerable to public input. Look at PERS. PERS is yeah. un underfunded oh, wow. by $20 billion. Oh, wow. A lot of the money that we throw, uh, you know, if we, were, if we were to send Salem a bunch of taxes right now, a fair amount of it would go yeah. to yeah. support the pension system. Yeah. We and just it wouldn't even get to the kids. Yeah, we just went through the election, if you will, and a bill passed. What is it, ninety-seven or something? Yeah, because all that money was going to basically go to some of the area, those areas. And Rebecca Tweed, who ran the No on ninety-seven campaign, right. is one of the speakers that's going to be at our conference really? next month. Oh, cool, cool, yep. cool. And Might get a little bit more background on that. Time. Yep, and and I should and I should say as a as a disclaimer here that while I'm expressing my personal opinions on some of these political questions, Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 and does not take right. positions right. On, right. on candidates, right. ballot measures, or legislation right. that are, you right. know, in progress. Right, right. Let's go back to, let's go back a bit, back to the, the, the national election, if you will, mm -hmm. with reference to Trump and, and Hillary, for that matter. The whole issue of hacking, you know, as yeah. soon as... As soon as the de determination on the Electoral College came out, mm -hmm. it just sort of shocked the other side, if you will. Mm -hmm. And Fox was just kind of like sitting there saying, well, that's what it's going to be, but we'll be the guys on this side that will challenge the other side. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, it just, it just reversed itself. But the whole idea of hacking, uh, I looked at a number of the, the so-called discussions 
among those in individuals and, and their own private so-called way of doing discussions. It. Yeah, discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But no one brought up the discussion about the, the facts. I mean, no one, no one talked about why discount what was was being hacked. Yeah, you you won't get a, a honest discussion about that until at least after the electoral college votes tomorrow. Jesus. Yeah. That's that's a that's a heavy piece because because the way I was looking at it at the end of that day, I said, well, look, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? We, we do why don't we do the hacking mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep it straight. Well, <laughs> you know, I think in, in my personal I'm just, I'm individual just opinion. Yeah. I think that another country um, attempting to hack um, our, you know, hack their way into manipulating our election yeah, yeah. borders on an act of war. Yeah, 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 okay. okay. I think it, it, it's, it's just like dropping a bomb on our constitution, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not saying that we're, we should be at war with Russia. Yeah. Uh, but I do think we need to look at this very carefully. From what I understand... Uh, Russia hacked into the DNC computers and was able to download a lot of information. They attempted to hack into the RNC computers, but they were unsuccessful at getting a bunch of information. Um, you know, like most people, I don't have access to what the intelligence agencies came up with, but I have not heard one blip of evidence. You're right, exactly. Indicating that anybody hacked into voting machines or manipulated vote counts or did anything of that sort. And so I think a lot of this right now, there is an issue as to the security of our system mm -hmm. and the intentions of, of foreign uh, you know, powers that don't like us very much. But I think that the rest of this is rhetoric designed to undermine the legitimacy mm -hmm. of Donald Trump's right, election. Right, right, right. We've, we've been hacking for you. I mean, everyone's been hacking. Everyone's been hacking Everyone for been, years. All over the country. I mean, yeah. all over the world. All over the world. Man. The high-tech stuff. I mean, we, there's a little amount of hacking in this, mm -hmm. this unit right here. But I think that, that Vladimir Putin has been emboldened. Oh, yeah. I think the key was this. When Obama drew the red line in Syria on using chemical weapons, mm -hmm. I don't think he should have done that. And I'm not for chemical weapons, but I think him drawing a red line was a mistake. But once he, it was crossed, having made that red line... He had to do something. He had to do what he said he would do, or he would lose credibility. And he lost credibility. And like a teacher leaving the classroom, it was perceived by the troublemakers that it's now okay to start throwing spitballs and all these other yes, things. Yes. And what? So what did we have? We had uh, Russia going into Ukraine. We had China with the Spratly yeah, Islands. Yeah. We had Iran beginning to make more trouble. We yeah. had, you know, a lot of these other things. And they said, "Look, Obama's not going to do anything." Yeah. And so uh, this all happened, and I don't think it was a coincidence. And this environment, in my opinion, emboldened Vladimir Putin to say, ah, let's mess with him a yeah, little bit. Let's yeah, hack yeah, in. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's do this. I think yeah. it's all part and parcel yeah. of, of what is perceived as a weak president. I'm not a big interventionist, but it is a dangerous world out there with dangerous people that don't wish us well. And we need to make it clear yes. that we will not tolerate mm -hmm. incursions and now that has to include cyber incursions mm -hmm. well you know the other thing too i, I as i look at this thing also too during the obama era aspect mm -hmm. of it again I, I was really a strong proponent about de dealing with the issue of race mm -hmm. but what comes along with it is that there's the other issues or the individuals that are saying hey they get caught up in it but the bottom line they're going through a transition aspect of it i start thinking about congress mm -hmm. i think i i start thinking about the um, the first thing that was said by one of the major leaders if you will in congress and that was the senate leader mm -hmm. mcconnell mm -hmm. and when he made the point about first day once once the guy won won it was i'm not going we're not going to do anything for this person so then how do you run a country <laughs> How do you run a country? You mean when Obama was elected? When, when Obama was elected. How yeah. do you run a country? And and hopefully he's learned some lessons on that. I hope folks have learned some lessons. We're going to have to go through that because during yeah. that eight-year period, mm -hmm. we could have resolved some of the issues during that particular period of time. We but could've. we were also discussing race, too, at the same time. Mm -hmm. so you, see, you see what I'm saying? You got yeah. me? So that race piece put it over here. So now we got to get back on track. Yes. And that's where that's where Trump is coming in. Because people were saying, well, look, I'm dissatisfied with the, with, the, with, the, with the politicians. I'm just I'm dissatisfied with the media aspect of it. I don't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. So outsiders, both him and, and who's, the, who's the other? Uh, Sanders, Bernie. Bernie we're, Sanders. We're both yeah. outsiders. Mm -hmm. But in one particular case, the outsider won the R side. Yeah, that's On the right. other side, Bernie didn't. That's right. You know, so guess what? 
anti that piece, right? So, so I'm just saying in terms of what you were saying in regards to um, the decisions that he was making and trying to run the country. That Obama? Was, Obama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there was this kind of no, 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 and there was no discussion about let's really talk about solutions. Sure. Because you can't just tell the whole world why you why you're trying to respond to s solutions. I, I disagree with an approach that says, you know, whatever you say, we're going to fight. Yes, that, that wasn't a good thing. I disagree with that. Um, having said that, in many of his major initiatives, Obama was taking us in the wrong direction. But then, but then I'm still and going back to that race. statement. But even I'm on still, race. But I'm still making that point. Yeah. See, I'm still making that point. Yeah. If we were all together. Yes. Then those issues would have been somewhat resolved because it had to have taken a person of color yeah. to be able to bring it to the table. It would have been discussed. Yeah. I think that in some of the um, shootings when there were still investigations pending, uh, Obama, I think, a couple of times stuck his nose in prematurely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, those kind of mistakes undermined it. I, I, I will say this I think whatever Obama's shortcomings and strengths, we now live in a world where a black American was elected president. Oh, yes, that's right. Okay? Yeah. Racism, is, a good thing. racism is still a problem in this mm -hmm, country, mm -hmm. but it is no longer, and, and we have to deal with it, mm -hmm. but it is no longer a prohibitive barrier. Mm -hmm. That's not a solution, but it is a step toward yeah. a solution. And we did that in the last eight years. And we did that we, twice. We yes. And we did that twice. And I think that if we reflect upon that, mm -hmm. that that reflection itself can create a new opportunity for discussions. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, believe that one of the answers is to come together as Americans. You know, I'm an Irish American, okay? In the early 19th century, Irish people were discriminated oh, yeah. against. Heavily, Italians. Right? Italian and I love, I love my St. Patrick's Day, and I love, you know, I don't get offended by Lucky Charms, Lucky, or, or, the, or the logo on the Notre Dame, you know, you know, I'm an American first, and I think we all need to think that way. If someone's an African-American or a Guatemalan-American or whatever it is, great. Celebrate your heritage. That's what the melting pot is about. Yeah. Maintain your language. Do what you need to do. But we've got to be Americans first. And if we are Americans first and we can ditch the identity politics, we can be more united while still celebrating and exposing ourselves to the cultural assets of each other. We've got to accept the we got to accept the the assimilation aspect of, yes. of what yes. we're doing. We have we to have not done that, but we need right. to do that and hopefully Trump will bring that he bring that to the table. He's talked about it to a certain Yeah, I think that what Trump's approach is to say is like uh, I think his approach is basically to say, come on, this is ridiculous. Yeah. We're Americans. Yeah. You're, you're Italian, fine. You're African, fine. You're Martian, fine. Whatever yeah, it is you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. That's great. But we're Americans yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that is a good approach. Yeah. I think the, the uh, liberals and progressives, they rely heavily on keeping people divided, having them feel aggrieved so that they can come and, you know, be their saviors. And the, and the way that you help people feeling aggrieved is to divide them up yeah. and a way to divide them up is to say in effect you're not americans first you're this first you're that first and uh even the language you know like um african-american africans first irish-american irish is first you know american of irish descent american of african descent this i think will facilitate unity mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. that not not the words themselves but the attitude that creates the words mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and that is the strength mm -hmm. of the melting pot mm -hmm. which has made this country so great well like you said that that's the that's the beauty that's the beauty of this country too you know due respect is that we, we were able to talk about this in the last for the, for the last eight years that's sure mm -hmm. everybody's carrying weapons yep there was no big mass shootings if you will if that matter i mean yep. sure there's, there's a there's a one percent or whatever I mean, you know something just occurred to me um, my wife We've been through this directly. She is um, a woman who was born in Ukraine. Yes. I, <laughs> right? And they definitely have their traditions. Yes, they do, And they've they got buddy. their cultures. Yes. And they've got their religion and mm -hmm. all of these things. So she came to the United States and 
she uh, maintains pride mm -hmm. in her heritage mm -hmm. and her traditions, but she wants to be an American. Mm -hmm. She wants to assimilate. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. learned English, mm -hmm. done these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we take this attitude, we can come together. Mm -hmm. Good. On that particular note, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Rich. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Sign up. Welcome back, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at Oregon Voters Digest. We're talking about 2016. We did that the last, the, the last, the first 30 minutes, if you will. In the second, thir second 30 minutes, we're going to talk about solutions. And then we're going to do that. We need leadership. I'm talking about Oregon. I'm talking about Oregon right now. Oregon. I mean, in all due respect, I could spend a little bit more time. In fact, we could spend the next two or three months or the next four years. Did you say Oregon? O o Oregon. 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 Yeah. It's not gone yet. That's what, that was the whole idea. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you got that? Okay, yeah. good. So what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to now spend a little time, if you will, on solutions to a, a number of our problems throughout the country. And every state's having these issues, if you will, mm -hmm. because we need, to, we need to respond to those issues. And now we want to talk about Oregon and, uh, and what are some of the solutions along those lines. And I think the, the way we're going to do that is that uh, we're in need of good leadership. We're in need of leadership either through education or the like, but we need leadership all over this country, for that matter. So we're going to talk about Western Liberty Network. Western, I mentioned it, I mentioned it uh, in the past, but, uh, but I think it's going to be very, very important uh, going in these next four years, next four years, mm -hmm. uh, next two years, for that matter. We've got an election coming up in the next two years, so it's going to be very important. So with that, uh, Rich, what is Western Liberty Network? Uh, it start, how did it begin, and... And uh, what are you what are you doing? I understand you got something going on the 28th of this month, or 27, 28. But, sure. But let's talk about Western Liberty Network. Well, uh, let me start by recounting an event that happened after the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Franklin came out, and a woman approached him and said, "What have you given us? A monarchy or a republic?" And Dr. Franklin said, "I've given you a republic, or we've given you a republic if you can keep it." Okay. To paraphrase. That's a challenge to us. We are founded on the idea that we can be a self-governing society. And keeping the republic means that if we're going to be a self-governing society, we have to actually take an active role and be responsible in governing ourselves. This is the central idea behind Western Liberty Network. Mm -hmm. Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 nonpartisan educational foundation which is designed to give individual political activists the tools they need to be successful in self-governance and to take their power back. It's our country, not theirs. And by theirs, I mean by, I mean the political class. Mm -hmm. This is our country. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to keep it, we need to take responsibility for governing it. Mm -hmm. So Western Liberty Network uh, offers affiliation to various organizations around the state. Right now there are 20 in Oregon and four in Washington. They're independent and they maintain their independence, but we offer them training in things like how to get elected to local nonpartisan office, how to manage campaigns for local office, how to volunteer for local office, and how to serve once you're there. Hmm. And so we offer these lines of training, and the idea is while we are nonpartisan in every way, we do support the principles of limited government. And we talk about reweaving the fabric of our political culture, one thread at a time. And that thread, each thread represents a local office, mm -hmm. a school board position, mm -hmm. a water board position, mm -hmm. park and rec position, okay? 
train people how to run for these positions and offer them limited government alternatives for governance, mm -hmm. like the kind that are put forward by the Cascade Policy Institute mm -hmm. and the Cato Institute. Train them how to function once they get elected. And uh, you will see things change. We have a very good track record. In 2013, we trained 98 candidates, people who wanted our training. 78 of them were elected. 78? 78. Wow. And uh, 131, I believe it was, in 2015 ran. 113 what of were some those of the got elected. What were some of the opposites? They ranged all the way from city councils and ESD board positions to community college board positions. But they went all the way down to cemetery control districts and road maintenance districts. But the idea is that over time, you keep pumping people into this system. Now, we don't recruit these candidates. We just offer them training, right? But you keep um, getting these people in there mm -hmm. and then training them how to govern. And pretty soon, some of them will stay where they are. A few of them might drop out. Some of them will rise higher. Um, one of our state legislators, Representative... Uh, Nearman, Mike Nearman, mm -hmm. got his start at our 2011 conference. Really? Now he's a state legislative, or now he's a state legislator. Very active. House of Representatives. That's right. And so you keep doing that, and you take a cloth that is one color, mm -hmm. and the threads get replaced. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon it starts to transform into another color. Mm, okay. And then uh, as you do that in your local government, take a look at a small town like Prineville. They've got service clubs like the Kiwanis and the Rotarians and all these and chambers of commerce. And they typically have public officials speak at these events. Not every time, but often. Yeah. And uh, they've been progressives and liberals in many cases. But you start getting limited government people in there and they're the ones making the speeches, right? Pretty soon they're influencing their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And the political culture begins to change. And if you have five, six, seven iterations of this, pretty soon limited government candidates for higher office might come from the lower offices. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't, mm -hmm. these, these candidates will endorse them. Mm -hmm. Develop networks, their own networks of activists, volunteers, donors. This is how you change things. But I think if we're going to protect our freedom, we're not going to do it from the White House. We're not going to do it from yeah. Congress. We're not going to do it from Mahoney Hall or Salem. We're going to do it if we want enduring change. And if we want more freedom and more limited government, we have to build it from below, from the grassroots, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have it come up from that. Mm -hmm. And Western Liberty Network is all about that. Now, when it's not the election cycle, we train people on how to lobby the legislature, how to write letters to the editor, how to call into radio shows, lots of how-tos, how to support a campaign with little or no money, how to write a good letter to the editor, toolbox. Mm -hmm. We don't tell them how to use the tools. Mm -hmm. We don't say, okay, we'll go work on that campaign or go work on that campaign. We don't never take positions on candidates, bills, or ballot measures. We give limited government activists tools. And of course, it's they're available to everybody. Right, 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 but we don't right. get a lot of progressives because they've already got a bunch of their own organizations mm -hmm. that offer training. If they came, they'd be welcome. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we offer people toolboxes. We don't tell them how to use the tools. We have a belief that over time, if you empower people to be successful, that uh, they will be successful, mm -hmm. or at least some of them will be. Okay. So it's just a numbers game at that okay. point. Well, let's talk about the 28th, if you will. All right, our conference. Well, some, yeah, let's talk about the conference. What's, what would be the makeup of the conference, and what's, what, what's, what can a person look forward to taking back with them? Okay. Um, this conference will be our sixth annual Leadership Activist Conference and Expo. And uh, it is an all-day event. It'll be on Saturday, the 28th of January. And what we have are three assemblies where we have speakers, and we will have a tabletop debate. But between those speakers, we will have a series of breakout sessions. We're going to have four breakout sessions. Uh, excuse me, uh, four tracks of instruction. Each one will have four breakout sessions through the day. One will be how to get elected to local office. The second track will be how to have an impact at the state legislature as a citizen lobbyist. Mm -hmm. The third track will be about the state of charter schools and school choice in Oregon. And the fourth track will deal with Oregon and Washington's urban-rural divide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there will be 16 breakout sessions along these subjects. 
attendees can pick and choose and mix and match mm -hmm. however they like. Mm -hmm. But during the three assemblies, we're going to have a variety of really good speakers. One of them is Grover Norquist, mm -hmm. who's president of the American Taxpayers Union. He's a national figure. Mm -hmm. Steve Buckstein of the Cascade Policy Institute. Uh, Rebecca Tweed, who ran the No on a 97 mm -hmm. campaign. Uh, Sam Carpenter, who ran for Senate. He's an author and and a businessman out of Bend. Uh, I'll be speaking. And uh, Scott Jorgensen, who you know well. He's been on the show. Yeah, on the show. Yep, big time. Big he's he's going to be there. Yep. And, yep. and uh, trainers, uh, Senator Tim Canope is going to be a trainer. Newt Bueller is going to be a trainer. Uh, and um, uh, Senator Kim Thatcher will be a trainer. And we've got a bunch of others, including yourself. Oh, yeah. Well, you got Becky. Maybe, maybe Be Becky might be there, I guess. Huh? That's right. Uh, yeah, Rebecca Becky Black, Black yeah. of the McCoy Academy is going to be there. And uh, there are others that, that will be there. And if people go to westernlibertynetwork.org, they can see the whole nine yards. They can yes. download an agenda. Yes. They yes. can register. They can secure a hotel room if they need one. Yes. Uh, we've got a good group rate. If they can't participate or they just want to support the conference, they can click on the sponsorship link and they can provide sponsorships if they want to. Okay. But this is all to support the conference. It's all nonprofit. And, uh, um, but uh, they can also download an agenda. They can see who all the speakers are, what all mm -hmm. the breakouts are. And it's uh, if westernlibertynetwork.org is where they can find out about it. Um, the night before is just going to be for fun. We have a reception. We have live jazz music and uh, hot appetizers. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. a no-host bar. Mm -hmm. And it's all at the newly remodeled Crown Plaza Hotel mm -hmm. in Lake Oswego mm -hmm. off of I-5 and 217. Mm -hmm. You can see it right off of I-5. Okay. And it's newly remodeled and just gorgeous. Well, you know, the other thing too I'd like to do is that I'd like to spend a little, a little more time with Rich here and ask you, Rich, um, uh, you know, I, I know about your background, but I want you to share that with us. And because in all due respect, you are you're basically, you are the sponsorship, if you will, of this particular conference, if you will. And I think they'd be very interested in your background. I, I, I started off at the beginning of the program talking about some of the things, mm. some of the activities you're involved in. But also, that uh, you might want to mention the fact that you also got training, too, and you're an elected official also. I've received some training. Okay. Um, I'm a commissioner on the Tualatin Valley Water District Board of Commissioners. I'm How long have you been doing it? A long time. I'm serving my fifth term. Fifth term. And uh, prior to that, I was elected to uh, two different local school committees in the Beaverton School District. Uh, I worked in the legislature for Senator Gary George and Representative Cliff Zahner uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, I was the uh, Libertarian nominee for Oregon governor in 1998. Uh, I've been a member of the National Committee and uh, I've been state party chair back in 1993. I worked for Americans for Prosperity for a few years, which is how I learned about how 501c3s work and kind of came up with some ideas for Western Liberty Network. Uh, I'm s currently a commissioner on the Oregon State Ethics Commission. Uh, I've done done a lot of different things. I've been around the track a few times. Good, 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 good. Well, in fact, let's, let's talk about some of those. Just recently, you were just appointed to, to the Ethics Commission, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Can you maybe share with us one, what is the definition of the Ethics Commission? What role does it play in, within our government aspect of it? And and uh, do you see any nuances, if you will, uh, that's coming up or uh, whatever? It's been really interesting. I've been on the Ethics Commission now for about three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, our job is to enforce the state ethics laws. You know, we're not there to enforce the idea of everybody being nice people or always doing the right thing, but we're there to deal with specific laws, ethics laws. And uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that all of the commissioners, to a person, Republican, Democrat, and me as a libertarian on the board, are not out there trying to do gotchas. Hmm. Okay? Our primary mission is education. And a lot of times when there are violations, if they haven't had violations before, the preference is always to issue a letter of education. Sometimes not even that, because ethics laws are sometimes used, especially in small towns, as a weapon against political rivals. Yeah. Um, I'll give you one fictitious example. There was a, a couple whose truck broke down in front of a county building, and it was 105 degrees outside. 
and they were trying very hard to fix their truck, but they were clearly suffering. And a manager saw them and said, well, come here, do your work underneath this roof. At least you'll be in the shade, right? It was a Sunday, nobody yeah. was working. Yeah. But one of the rivals of this manager witnessed this and turned it in as an ethics law violation. Really? And technically it was an ethics law huh. violation. They were using a resource, a public resource, to help somebody in a manner that wasn't available to everyone. And that is a violation of ethics laws. Hmm. But uh, although it was technically a violation, it was really clear that it was a politically motivated thing. And so we issued a letter of education, mm. right? With, without, a, without a fine. Because I'll tell you, all of the votes that I've seen, with very few exception, are unanimous. And Republican or Democrat, if there is not a willful, you know, a purposeful violation mm -hmm. of ethics laws, they really want to give people a break. And, I th and I'm really happy about that because we do need transparency. We do need to avoid things like uh, conflict of interests and nepotism uh, and, and other hazards that can come with abuse of power. Uh, and so it's, it's really interesting to see the different cases come up. Sometimes they're important cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes there are serious violations. Uh, but um, it's, if, if, it's handled, if it's handled wrong, it's a way for government to harass people. But if it's handled correctly, it is a way to keep our government transparent and to avoid things like corruption and nepotism. Hmm. And so it's, it's uh, we're under a lot of scrutiny, which is proper, and our meetings are all public. And so it's, it's been an interesting position hmm. to be in. I'm very proud of the staff and the other commissioners. Yeah, yeah. How, many, how many board members are there? There are nine. Nine board members mm -hmm. made up of um, R's, D's, and equal portions? Well, I, I don't know how many of them are R's or D's. I think the D's, uh, there have been one more D than R, mm -hmm. but they expanded the board from seven to nine, and so they needed to appoint people, and the deal was the Republic, as I understand it, mm -hmm. the Republicans could sort of put up a name and the Democrats could put up a name, but neither of them could put up somebody in their own party. Mm. And so uh, I got put up after they considered a few people, and uh, the Democrats put up a gentleman who I think is either not affiliated or independent, and who works with labor unions. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's mm -hmm. that's right. And then now, Kate Brown appoints, uh, right. technically appoints us, and the Senate votes on us. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so any big big cases that are on the on the table at this point in time, or something from a historical standpoint, there's some still old stuff still sitting up there. Well, I mean, not that. It, yeah. You, if, whatever you can share, let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I think I can good. share what's publicly known. Um, I, there haven't been any big cases since I've been on the board, but prior to my being on the board, some of the stuff relating to Governor Kitzhaber was right. a, a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what's going to come out of that mm -hmm. or if it's well, going to come back ongoing, to the board. Because there's still some issues out there. Yeah, and, and I expect that you know over the course of, of my four-year term, there will be some mm -hmm. controversial situations like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to try and do my job as best I can, and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the others will too. Okay. Again, maybe get back to, you, you said on education, right? Is that is that the That's primary, the is primary, that the primary function. function aspect of it? Yes. So anything that relates to the education, whether it be schools or college? Well, not that. I mean, with uh, on, the, on the ethics board, the educational mission is confined to uh, educating people about ethics laws. Okay, ethics laws. Yes. And how do you define ethics laws? It's all, f it's all defined in, in statute, okay. and it applies to public office holders and uh, lobbyists, or registered lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And if you're an employee of a public entity, you're a public official. Mm -hmm. So if you're a garbage collector for the city, you're a public official, and ethics laws apply to you. Okay. Uh, okay. There's, in, and so the idea is our board is designed to educate. I don't know if it's this way anymore, but it used to be if you went on a uh, uh, to a convention, like you're a you know mm -hmm. a park and rec person, you go mm -hmm. to a convention. Uh, if you stand up 
and food is provided, it's a meal. If you sit down, it's not a meal, or vice versa, mm -hmm. right? And you had to report it differently. And if you report it differently, mm. you know, if you report it wrong, it's technically mm. a violation. You know, most people, it's the legislature has, I think, responsibility to make the laws reasonable and under understandable. Um, and public officials have a responsibility to learn what they can. And there are training opportunities that are available. Uh, and um, it's easy to accidentally violate mm -hmm. an arcane rule. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important that the Ethics Commission not be a uh, gotcha agency, but to try and do what it can to promote transparency okay. in government. Who's in the position to uh, report, if you will, the violation? Anybody can, yeah. if they really? witness yeah. it. How does yeah. one go about doing that? Uh, well, um, who's, who's the one contact? Is there the Oregon State Ethics Commission? Oregon State Ethics Commission, yep, and they have the guidelines. I mean, do they, I just call there. them up, tell them what's going on, and they'll give you instructions on how to file. You call a the governor's office. Hey, look, I'd like to talk to the Ethics Commission about a violation. It's in. I, th I don't know what the number is, but it's on the web. If you type in Oregon State Ethics Commission, Oregon State Ethics Commission, you'll, you'll be able to uh, okay. see. There, they have a website, okay. and all the contact information okay. is provided. Okay. Okay. And you talked a little bit about the sitting up, getting lunch, or not getting lunch, and this mm -hmm. thing. And can you can you buy lunch from folks or along that line? There are at, there at the are standpoint. There are extreme limits. Uh, I, I would if if I was giving advice to a newly elected, and this is part of what Western Liberty Network does for folks that get elected. Okay, is we offer them an initial training on ethics. Oh. And we should, how not to so you will break be talking to Western Liberty. Yeah, and and uh, then um, you know we show them how to get more information, uh -huh. and it also trains activists how to detect violations of ethics laws. Okay, uh, but um, interesting. Yeah, um, but uh, you know if people want to file a complaint, they just call the ethics commission. Sure, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, hey, this has been just great. I mean, we got about another five minutes or so. I just sure. maybe uh, may take the advantage of it now just spend a little time about our own state and our own issue. We just had a gubernatorial race, as you yes, did. did, and that's mm -hmm. only for two years. Yep. We'll be up for another two years, mm -hmm. come up two years. And just so happened, um, uh, Kate Brown was appointed initially, so she is the governor now. And, and she, she was she, elected and to she was fulfill, elected the, to rest fulfill the rest of the, the time of yeah. Kids Hopper's mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. okay, aspect of it. So that'll be another race coming up at this point in time. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, there's, there's naturally there's been some issues with the with the administration yeah. at this point in time. Anything that you see of major issue? You think? Well, I think that there have been some major issues, but there are some bigger ones coming up. Is that right? Yeah, the uh, measure 97 tax increase failed, which and I think what, is a what, good thing. From a lay standpoint, what do, what does that mean? I mean, what what were they trying to do? What, what was they that? were trying to raise about six billion dollars by issuing what would amount uh, to a sales tax. Uh, by taxing large corporations okay. who made more than $25 million. And, of course, this tax would be passed on to us. Mm -hmm. And the Oregon uh, Revenue Office said it would cost, on average, each family about $600 a year. Mm. Other people thought that it would be about twice that much money. Mm -hmm. So it was a big tax grab. But they don't have it now. And so now they're claiming that they're, I forget how much, $1.3 or $1.6 billion short, uh, which astounds me because the money that's coming in is more than they've ever had. Mm -hmm. But they use this current service level mm -hmm. uh, format. I think that one thing they need to do is start using zero-based budgeting instead of current service level budgeting. Mm -hmm. So they start to justify all of the money they spend every time, mm -hmm. not just tack on a percentage mm -hmm. to what they had before and say that's mm -hmm. current service level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Dennis Richardson being elected to the position of Secretary of State will help because he will conduct audits of state agencies aggressively, and we'll be able to find out where the fat is. I think a big problem that uh, we're dealing with financially in this state is the un underfunded PERS fund, which I think at last count was about $20 billion yeah, underfunded, and still hasn't been resolved. Oh, man. Yes. And I think that uh, as long as that's there, it's going to be really hard to uh, provide for stable budgets for the, the, the mm -hmm. legitimate yes, functions yes, of yeah, government. Yeah. And so it's always going to be, well, you're going to throw grandma into the snow and mm -hmm. the kids are going to have schools mm -hmm. with their ceilings mm -hmm. falling down on them. And, you know, and so we're going to be blackmailed into yeah. trying, they're going to try to raise more taxes yeah. 
when what they really need to do is get their house in order. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, I mean even when you think about that prayer situation, you think about, i.e., a football coach, if you will, making 500000 over half a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, you know, in But retirement. that's nothing. I mean, that's, that's insulting. It, 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 well, to a certain I don't know degree. about I mean, that. Well, my point is that government, now this is mm-hmm. just my own perspective. Yeah. Government was not, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't designed, if you will, to make rich folks. Well, you know, but when you but, have... But a good retirement. You, you have a, I understand, but look at the dysfunction that started this. We have government-owned sports franchises. Yeah. Like the Ducks and Beavers. Well, I know, yeah. That's what right? I mean. but, and, if, and, and if you're going to make money, which they do, I mean, you've got the coach that has the salary that they're able yeah, to... Yeah, but I can't afford the tickets. I can't go. afford the tickets either. <laughs> but, man, I'll tell you, if, if you're if a university... Minutes. Okay, if you're the University of Oregon... Or Oregon State, th- those are your cash cows, I, and it's, I, I, and it's I, I, worth yeah. paying a qualified coach a ridiculous yeah, but, but, sum of money so that yeah, you can make more money. But, but that's part of my money. I'm not going to the games. Yeah, I, I, and I'm paying for that. But too. see, but see, the question is, should the state be in the sports business? That's the question. My position is no. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, if the Blazers pay their pay their coach. You know, tons well, that's of money. The private what we, side. That's exactly, the private side. Exactly. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. On this other yeah. side, here, I'm paying for it. Because I don't see and I'm anything. Not going to the game. I don't see anything in the in the Constitution that says government will provide football yeah, teams. Yeah. Right. 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 This we, could be done. Again, that's another discussion we can have. Yeah. And it all talks to it's purrs. It's a farm team for the and NFL. It talks about purrs too. Yeah. See? That's, that's purrs. Right. It's purrs. I mean, I, I love football. Yeah. Well, same. Same here. Same here. Yeah. Well, look, buddy. Uh, look like we are going to have to have some. We're going to cr- really create it. Now they need to get to the conference to get a sense of get to the get conference. Okay? WesternLibertyNetwork.org. WesternLibertyNetwork.org. Yep, that's right. Rich has always been a pleasure. I love it. Always Thank been you. great. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, good, folks. Have you heard us? You see it? There it is, buddy. Now look, you've got to prepare yourself. Get with your neighbors. Get involved. Get involved. Read the newspaper. I don't know what we're going to do about the Comcast bill aspect of it. Maybe if it's a little bit more competitive, you might be able to afford it. Or if not that, maybe you might want to challenge those free waves again. Yeah, well, it's on. Those yeah. airwaves. Those airwaves. Get the Internet yeah. somewhere else and you watch you on you the go. net. Might there be able to do it over here. Yeah. Go. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I got it. I got it. So I guess that's where we are, folks. Again, thank you very much for being with us, and I'll see you in 2017. We won't be back. We, we, we're still closed there. We're still about another 10 or 15 seconds that we're I'll just repeat, Western Living the Network, go to the conference. And again, happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays to everyone. Looking forward. We're going we're gonna to be very exciting. It's going to be very exciting here on the Oregon Voters Digest come 2017. In fact, you're going to be seeing this guy maybe every other month. I'm, I'm ready. Talking about his stuff. He's going to be ready, too. No, I don't have to.